There's always been an element of danger when traveling by sea. Stories of sea creatures like the Kraken, ghost ships like the Flying Dutchman, or maritime tragedies like the Titanic have captured the human imagination for centuries. Despite that, there are some stories that remain largely unknown. For instance, the loss of the Titanic was not the only supposedly unsinkable passenger steamship lost to the sea. Another ship that suffered that same fate was the SS Waratah, who had disappeared without a trace only three years before the sinking of the Titanic. In September 1907, an order was placed with the British shipbuilding company Barclay Curl of Glasgow for a new cargo and passenger vessel for Blue Anchor Lines Shipping Company. Given the name SS Waratah, the vessel was launched on the 12th of September 1908. Waratah was based on an already existing steamer called the SS Geelong as the owners wanted the ship to be an improved version of that ship. The ship was meant to operate between Europe and Australia and was designed for speed and luxury. At 465 feet long and weighing around 9,339 tons, the Waratah had eight staterooms and a salon as well as a luxurious music lounge complete with a minstrel's gallery. There was also plans of using the ship as an emigrant ship. As such, her cargo holds were converted into large dormitories capable of holding almost 700 passengers on the outward journeys. On return journeys, the holds would be used to store frozen meat, dairy products, wool and metal ore from Australia. The vessel had a steel hull and two sets of quadruple expansion steam engines. She had a cellular double bottom built along her entire length, which was divided into eight watertight compartments. It was believed that these watertight compartments rendered the Waratah practically immune from any danger of sinking. Perhaps that belief is why the Waratah wasn't equipped with a radio at the time of construction, though that wasn't unusual for the time. On the 5th of November 1908, Waratah left London for her maiden voyage with 689 third-class passengers and 67 first-class passengers on board. She was under the command of Captain Joshua Edward Ilbury, who had 30 years of nautical experience. She also carried a crew of 154. After a brief stop at Cape Town on the 27th of November, the Waratah arrived at Adelaide on the 15th of December 1908. While the trip had been largely successful, it wasn't without its problems. Early in the morning of the 6th of December 1908, a small fire had broken out in the lower starboard bunker. The fire was put out by noon the same day, but it kept reigniting until it was finally brought under control four days later on the 10th of December. Supposedly, this fire was caused by the heat emitted by several steam valves located on the starboard side of the engine room. The roof of the engine room was insulated, but the starboard side was not. The ship would stop briefly at Sydney, where repairs would be made, before the ship finally arrived in Adelaide. The Wartow would then embark on the journey back to London on the 9th of January 1909. She was carrying a cargo of food, wool, and 1,500 tons of metal concentrates. She arrived in London on the 7th of March 1909 to finalize her maiden voyage. After the cargo was unloaded, the ship was put into dry dock where she underwent some minor repairs and was inspected by a Lloyd's inspector. Captain Ilbury and his crew raised some concerns regarding the ship's handling and stability. The captain was concerned with the difficulty of properly loading the steamer to maintain her stability. 
and one passenger who traveled on the Warta on her maiden voyage, named Mrs. Patton, would later tell the Daily News Perth that the ship rolled more than any other vessel that she had traveled on, and that the Warta seemed very slow in recovering herself. Mrs. Patton would even compare the Warta with the steadiness of a ship from the White Star Line. On the 27th of April 1909, Warta would set out on her second trip to Australia. This time she was carrying 22 cabins, 193 steerage passengers and a crew of 119. The trip to Australia would be largely uneventful and the steamer arrived at Adelaide on the 6th of June. After briefly stopping in Melbourne, she continued to Sydney where she loaded her cargo before departing on the 26th of June for the return voyage. With almost 100 passengers and a convict that was being extradited to Transvaal Colony who was accompanied by two Transvaal policemen. Warta reached Durban on the morning on the 25th of July, where a few passengers including one Claude G. Sawyer would depart the ship. Sawyer would send a message to his wife in London that read, Thought Warta Top Heavy, Landed Durban. Sawyer would later testify that he had originally booked passage on the Warta through to Cape Town, but that the behavior of the ship during the voyage made him so nervous that he decided to disembark at Durban. After stopping at Durban, the Warta would then leave at around 8.15 p.m. on the 26th of July with 211 passengers and crew. At around 4 a.m. on the 27th of July, the Warta was spotted by the Clan Line steamer Clan McIntyre. The ships would draw level at about 6 a.m. The ships would then communicate by signal lamp and exchange customary information about the name and destination of their respective ships. The Warta would then remain in sight of Clan McIntyre until about 9.30, when she disappeared over the horizon. The Clan McIntyre sighting would be the last confirmed sighting of the Warta, but there have been a number of unconfirmed sightings of the ship. For instance, a ship called the Harlow would report seeing the smoke of a steamer on the horizon at around 5.30 p.m. on the 27th of July. Supposedly, there was so much smoke that the captain of the Harlow had wondered if the steamer was on fire. As it gradually got darker, the crew would see two bright flashes from the direction of the steamer. The captain thought that those bright flashes were caused by explosions on the steamer, but the mate of the Harlow thought the flashes were brush fires on shore, which was a common phenomenon in the area at that time of year. The captain would eventually agree with the mate and he did not enter the events in the log. In fact, he wouldn't even think much of this sighting until he learned of the disappearance of the SS Warta. That same evening on the 27th, at around 9.30 p.m., the Union Castle liner Gelp would pass a ship. Like the Clan McIntyre, they would exchange signals by lamp, but they could only catch the last three letters of the other ship as T-A-H due to the bad weather and poor visibility. So while it's believed that this may have been a sighting of the Warta, it's not a confirmed one. Another possible sighting came from Edward Joe Conker, who was a member of the South African military unit Cape Mounted Riflemen. On the 28th of July, he was posted to carry out military exercises on the banks of the mouth of the Sora River. He recorded in his diary that he had observed a steamship that appeared to be struggling slowly against heavy seas in a southwesterly direction. From what he could see, this steamship matched the description of the Warata, and as Conker watched through the telescope, this ship would roll heavily to starboard. Before the ship was able to right itself, a following wave would roll over the ship, causing it to disappear from view entirely. Assuming that the ship had now gone under, Conker would report his sightings to his base camp and to his orderly sergeant who did not take the matter seriously. The SS Warta would never be seen again. Ed 
S's water not showing up on time did not cause any alarm as it was common for ships to arrive days or even weeks late. The water was also considered to be unsinkable, so the initial thought was that she had simply been delayed by a mechanical fault. However, as ships which had left Durban after the Warta reported no sight of her en route, fear started growing. And it kept on growing until the first search was launched by the tugboat T.E. Fuller on the 1st of August 1909. But after encountering dreadful weather, the tugboat was forced to abandon her search efforts and return to port. The Royal Navy would then deploy cruisers HMS Pandora and HMS Forte to search for the Warta, but they also had to return to port due to large and strong waves. Then on the 13th of August 1909, a steamship called the Insiwa reported sighting several bodies on the Embassy River's mouth, which was the same location where the Warta was last seen. The captain of another ship called the Tottenham would allegedly also see bodies in the water more than two weeks after the Warta had disappeared. Another tugboat was then sent out to search for these bodies, but they didn't find anything beyond dead skates, which did resemble dead bodies in the water from a distance. Despite not finding the ship, there was still some hope that the Warta was still afloat and drifting somewhere. So more and more searches would be sent out, but the ship would never be seen again. And despite several unconfirmed reports, no confirmed wreckage of the Warta has ever been found. Once it was clear that the ship had been lost, an inquiry on the ship's disappearance would be held in December of 1910 at Caxton Hall in London. One thing that they looked at was the supposed instability of the ship. Expert witnesses all agreed that the Warta was designed and built properly. She had passed numerous inspections, including those by her builders, her owners, the Board of Trade, and two by Lloyds of London. But witnesses who had traveled on the ship on her maiden voyage would testify that the ship felt unstable. According to the witnesses, the ship would frequently list to one side even in calm conditions. Just like Mrs. Patton would tell the Daily News, many of the witnesses testified that the ship rolled excessively and was very slow to recover. However, for every witness that said that the ship was unstable, another witness would claim that she wasn't. Some of the former passengers and crew members said that the Warta was completely stable. Because of these conflicting testimonies, the inquiry was unable to reach any definite conclusion. The Blue Anchor Line would not be blamed for the ship's disappearance, but they would receive a lot of negative publicity stemming from the war test disappearance, the inquiry, and criticism of the company. This led to ticket sales dropping and the company would also take a huge financial loss in the construction of the Warta, which was underinsured. The company was eventually forced to sell its other ships to its main competitor and declared voluntary liquidation in 1910. There are several theories relating to the disappearance of the SS Warta. One theory is that the Warta was hit by a rogue wave in the ocean off the South African coast, which are common in that area. Rogue waves are huge, unpredictable, and can appear suddenly without warning. They are not the same as a tsunami and can be caused by storms and high winds. After the last confirmed sighting of the Warta by the clan McIntyre, the weather had deteriorated with increasing wind and rough seas, which even developed into a cyclone by the 28th of July. The captain of the clan McIntyre even said that it was the worst weather that he had experienced at sea in his 13 years as a seaman. 
Based on this, we know that the water was moving through really bad weather, and since rogue waves can be caused by storms, it is very possible that the water would be hit by a giant wave that may have caused the ship to either roll over or fill the holds with water which then would pull the ship down almost instantly. If the ship rolled over, any debris would be trapped under the wreck, which would then explain the fact that no bodies or even wreckage from the ship has ever been found. Another theory that blames the forces of nature suggests that the Warata might have been caught in a whirlpool, created by a combination of winds, currents and a deep ocean trench. Several of these types of whirlpools are known to be off the southeast coast of Africa, though there is no firm evidence that a whirlpool strong enough to sink such a large ship could be created under those conditions. Other theories look at the cargo that the Warta was carrying. The ship was carrying around 100 tons of lead and about 300 tons of lead ore concentrate, and these concentrates are known to liquefy due to the motion of the ship under certain circumstances. So if this happened, then the ship's stability would be affected, which might potentially cause it to capsize. And the final theory is that the ship might have been destroyed by an explosion. If the officers of the Hollow really did see the Warta and if the flashes that they saw were an explosion, then it might be possible that a sudden explosion is the cause for the destruction of the ship. But while that is possible, the size of the ship would mean that there should have been enough time to launch a lifeboat or a raft, not to mention that an explosion would cause a lot of debris. And as I mentioned before, nothing has been found of the ship. No bodies, no debris, and no wreckage. SS Warta is often compared to the RMS Titanic. The Warta has even been referred to as the Titanic of the Southern Seas, the Titanic of the South, or even Australia's Titanic. In 1999, it was believed that the wreckage had been found off the eastern Cape Coast, but this wreckage would turn out to be a cargo ship that was carrying military hardware, tanks, tires and trucks, that had been struck by a U-boat in 1942. While an interesting find on its own, it was not the wreckage of the SS Warta. And as of right now, the ship remains elusive, despite numerous searches. And while it's commonly accepted that the ship sank, until the wreck is found, we can only guess the fate of the SS Warta.